Stephanie Parks, our anthropology major. Stephanie, you're <laughs> uh, Yes, today we're going to talk about Henri Riviere, who was a French artist who was very influenced by Japanese. Uh, he lived from 1864 to 1951. Um, in 1870, what happened? The Franco Russian War. So, Anyway, to get out of Paris, his family moved out to I, which is this beautiful countryside, rural location. And it was really out here that Henri really developed a love for the outdoors. And we see this later on with his obsession with landscapes. Um, in 1881, his brother Jules came into some money uh, for passing his college entrance exams. And so the two of them went on vacation to Brittany, which we've discussed before. It's a seaside area of France. It's beautiful. And Riviere went out there and um, began to paint landscapes and kind of fell into that pattern of just painting landscape after landscape. But in 1888, uh, gallery owner Siegfried Bing opened a Japanese art exhibition in his gallery. And this really changed Riviere's I guess, outlook on landscape, because on view in this exposition was uh, Hokusai's 36 views Mount Fuji. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, um, from 1888 to 1902, Riviere worked on the 36 views of the Eiffel Tower, that book in the corner, it's being passed around, so take a look through there, it's really cool. Um, but in 1889, well, let me back up a little bit. Riviere had a very prolific career, and he worked with the Chat Noir. Uh, he he kind of did a bunch of odd jobs for them. He did puppet shows and shadow shows for them that became very popular. And then he ended up working for a publication that came out of the Chat Noir. And so, unlike a lot of these artists at the time, at least he had a day job. <laughs> so he could make some money that way. But, for the 1889 World's Fair, which was going to be in Paris, Gustave Eiffel created the Eiffel Tower, and they began building it in 1888. But in 1889, Eiffel invited Salis, the owner of the Chateau Noir, to go tour it, and Salis invited Rudier. So he really got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to check out that. And we'll look at some photographs from that in a little bit. Um, so. Erica talked about this, the opening of Japan. If you've ever taken a world history class, you have definitely seen this picture before. Um, in 1854, Matthew Perry reopened commerce with Japan. And in 55, you start seeing the first wave of Japanese goods really hitting Europe, um, or you know, areas of Europe other than um, the Netherlands. Um, but in well, after this happened, the shogunate fell, and then Japan had a presence at the World's Fairs that happened in Paris. So it's kind of cultivating this interest in the Parisian population, and uh, people just want to get their hands on cool goods from Japan. You know, oh, I want a fan. Oh, I want a kimono. It reminds me of, you know, Catherine's presentation with the Stevens photo with the Parisian woman in her lingerie with the kimono over it. You, you see it just exploding in daily life in the middle and upper classes. Um, but the 88, for our purposes today, that was the exposition at Siegfried Bing's, Siegfried Bing's gallery uh, that really inspired Riviere. Um, Hokusai created 36 views of Mount Fuji. This was a series, and um, obviously it just had Mount Fuji in it, but it documented the landscape and also, I, I put this Riviere uh, print from his series, 36 Views of the Eiffel Tower, um, to kind of contrast and compare the series. But uh, similarly, obviously, they're both a series, 36 Views of Insert Land Form here. Um, <laughs> they both have asymmetrical compositions with strong diagonals. I mean, look at the mountain. It's just cutting across the composition. And this, the leaves are cutting across right there. Um, there's a muted color palette that you see throughout the series. Um, Hokusai was using blue a lot because there was this <coughs> guy called Berlin Blue that was 
introduced in the early 1800s um, from the Dutch, and it became really popular in Japan. So he used that in a lot of his prints in this series. But uh, Revere just kind of stuck with a muted color palette. Um, and in both of them, you're focusing on a dominant picture that's rising in the landscape. For Hokusai, it was Mount Fuji, and for Riviere, it was the Eiffel Tower. But like we've mentioned, they both blow up aspects of nature that are considered like not subject matter. You know, they're unimportant areas. But it kind of creates a fun series for you because it's a Where's Waldo effect. You know, where in this photo is Mount Fuji? Where's the Eiffel Tower? So it, it keeps the viewer interested and has this sense of continuity through it. So <laughs> to begin with, um, Riviera wanted to be as authentic as possible with Japanese style. He created his own woodcutting um, <coughs> tools. They're very crude. He actually had a Japanese printmaker who came to tour his studio and said, I have better stuff at home than this. But he, he wanted to stay authentic. He wanted to do it all by himself, which ironically was not authentic. Because in Japan, you have this workshop tradition that we just talked about. You know, you've got the head designer, and then you've got people who carve the wood blocks. But then you can just churn them out like you know nothing. That's why they were so inexpensive. That's why people could buy a lot of them because once you finally had this labor down, it's easy to create the prints, and you could create a high belt, like a high volume of them. <coughs> um, Riviere decided that maybe doing all of this by himself was a little too time consuming. So after this one composition, he switched back to lithographs for the rest of the series because he realized if he was going to stick with woodcuts, he was going to be doing this one series for the rest of his life. So um, Chantier de la Torre Bell, this one is seven blocks that he carved that were all glued together. Um, so it was a pretty big composition. But uh, both of these, if you compare with Hokusai's uh, lumber yard in Hanjo, which was part of the Mount Fuji series, you can see it up in the corner, where's Waldo well Mount Fuji? But um, they both have, you know, they've got these modern laborers in modern dress. So we see that impressionist kind of drive to depict modern life, and they're all interacting with this aspect of nature and you know as close as you get to nature in Paris I guess for Riviere because um, that Eiffel Tower became a very important part of his landscape of urban Paris. So um, like I said in 89 Riviere got invited to go preview the Eiffel Tower which had to be kind of scary. I was reading about it in um, <laughs> they didn't have waivers or whatever, but they told you, be very, very careful climbing this. You know, don't fall off the tower. You're not a skilled laborer like these other people working on it. Just watch your step. So, um, Riviera really got the chance of a lifetime to go preview this, but he was very prepared for it because he was using a certain type of photography that wasn't popular yet. He was changing it a little bit because use well, I mean, in this era in photography, you had a big setup for your camera. You had to have it on a tripod. It wasn't <coughs> portable. You couldn't like go down the street taking snapshots as easily as you would have liked to. Um, but Riviere actually developed his own emulsions that were really fast acting, and he created a box camera that was portable, and with the fast-acting emulsions and then this portable camera, he was able to, you know, take his camera wherever he wanted, and he was able to take multiple exposures without immediately processing his film. So it was pretty much the beginning of our film cameras, you know, you shoot a whole roll and then you go develop. Um, so that worked out really well for him, and he was able to take his camera up on the Eiffel Tower in 1889 when it was being constructed. I mean, how many people got to do that? That's so cool. So 
Um, you can see that he made his prints, these are now lithographs. Um, he made these based on the photographs that he took when he was climbing the tower. Um, I just, I think these are beautiful. And one thing that I read, um, I mean, if you look at this photograph, other than the quality, it's compositionally modern. It's, you know, it's something interesting and it's, it's something that you wouldn't be surprised to see a modern photographer, you know, displaying in a gallery. Um, but you can see in the print, he's got inspiration coming from the photographs as well is from Hokusai's traditions. Um, from the photo inspiration, you see there's very simple color palette. I mean, you're kind of limited when you only have black and white film. <laughs> so he keeps the colors pretty simple. It's this cropped, up close and personal feeling um, where it kind of takes a second for you to go, what, what's exactly going on? What am I looking at? And I mean, you would know, obviously, if you were looking at a series, you were looking at the Eiffel Tower, but just standing alone, you may wonder what this is. Um, but from the Yukioi inspiration, Yukioi being the Japanese wood cut print um, style, you see that same simple color palette, very strong diagonals cutting across the composition, and you're focusing on a subject in a series with a muted landscape in the background. That's exactly like, you know, 36 views of Mount Fuji. Um, with these photographs, he took 39 while he was on the tower, and um, <coughs> out of these, he really focused on two things. One was the interaction of metal against the landscape. And then I'll talk about the other one in a second. But this is going to be your key work, Dan's Just because I think it's really great. So. Um, but finally, this is another one from his excursion up to the top. But this just scares me so much. <laughs> I can't. Imagine how frightening it would be to be a laborer for the Eiffel Tower on that rickety little scaffolding. And I mean, in the photograph, you don't see too much wind displayed. And maybe Riviera is taking some artistic license here. But I mean, he's got these ropes flapping in the wind. And oh man, it would be terrifying to be up there. But uh, the second thing that he really focused on was the interaction between man and metal. And perfectly displayed here, you've got laborers working on this tower. You have the Parisian city in the background in the photograph at least, but he decided to take that out of his lithograph just so you could focus on the interaction of man and metal. Um, again, from the photo influence, you've got a simple color palette, you've got a modern snapshot composition. Like Again, other than the content, you would you would still see this in a museum or a gallery. Um, from the Yukioi tradition, same thing. Muted color palette, very strong diagonal coming from that rope across to the beach there. So, um, all in all, Henry Revere used this series to document his, his experience of living in Paris and to just show his interaction and everyone's daily interaction with this new feature in the modern landscape and how the town was adjusting to it. So that's about all I have to say. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, Rebecca. Um, how many prints did he make from the photos? You said there were 39 photos, but did he make them? Yes. Um, in the series, he just stuck to 36. And obviously not all of those are from photos. And I don't have the number, but whoever has the book, I think Kim back there has the book. You could go through it and see which ones are actually taken like from the tower, because they're very different. Um, I don't have any pictures in my PowerPoint of it, but there are a lot kind of like the one with the leaves. Um, there are some, I know we passed around those um, wood block prints a second ago, and there's a few of it changing throughout the seasons. You know, it's in the background, there's snow falling everywhere, there's Parisians walking around. So the ones that are based on photographs, you can definitely tell you're like, oh, this is up close, he's on the tower. So you would be able to 
But for the other ones that I was showing, the lithographs, they all look the same. They all look the same. Yeah. Uh, color wise. Were those, because those are printed in a book, were those mm -hmm. uh, actually done plate by plate or how was that done? Plate by plate into a book? Yeah. I mean, how was that done? Um, I'm not too sure. I think honestly. I think they were initially a portfolio of individual. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't initially for a book, but just like transferring it into a book. I'm not sure what that process was, or if you downsized them or resized them, or you know how exactly that came. To what be. just anecdote? One year, uh, the 4100. What? Well, one year the course I was teaching was called Japan in the West, and so the 4100 was focused on something Japanese, and we went to Chicago um, where we could study Frank Lloyd Wright's embrace of Japanese stuff. And in the prints and drawings department of the Art Institute of Chicago, one student handled five prints by the year that they had in their collection. And we, that's the, on that basis, I have seen prints in other series that help me appreciate something you have said in your presentation that I never really thought about very much. So I'm grateful for your observation that the limited palette of the Eiffel Tower series is a limited palette compared to his other his other work. Oh, and yeah, that makes the, the, the right. photographic connection even more powerful. I was whispering to Rebecca when you were showing us the last in, uh, the, no, the in the tower image. <coughs> Previous one. The clouds. Look, they look a lot like the Hokusai <coughs> Fuji clouds, which are these little, you know, flat, organic shapes, which he had to invent because, as you can see, they didn't survive in the photograph because the yeah, exposure well, time might have been shorter, but it wasn't short enough to get clouds. I appreciate your sense of fear. Of it. I cannot oh, imagine man. what it was like to go up there. It had to been windy. That would have been scary. Um, okay, the ones I like show it like being like built over time. Are these like historically accurate, or is it is it just like his like? I don't know if that makes sense. Like, is this what it looked like, and then it snowed like, during the winter? It got up this high. Yes. You know, like, yeah. Okay. So he's actually like, seeing it. And yeah, it he's like, doing okay. it as it goes, I guess. Well, I mean, he worked on these prints for a really long time. It was eighty-eight to nineteen o two. So, I mean, maybe he was taking photographs of it, or maybe he just remembered, oh, I remember it was about yay high in the winter of whatever. So, you know. If you Google Eiffel Tower, you will see a zillion photographs of it under construction, and there's one big <coughs> sequence. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's up. You know, there are posters you can buy. Very popular subject. So it would have been easy for him to use photographs made by other people, too. Sorry, I should have let you answer those questions. No, I'm not all excited. Are there any other questions? It's too bad he couldn't finish them in 1889. I know. You've seen what Gauguin was selling at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. It would have been really something to have Riviere's Eiffel Tower pictures. Well, I mean, if he had finished it in 89 for the World's Fair, how cool would it have been to have what we were just talking about, the photos and the prints together? I mean, that would have been really dynamic, but yes, it didn't happen. As a little postscript, you should know that some people hated the Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. Among them was Charles Garnier, the architect of the opera. He thought it was an abomination, and he helped, he signed a petition. Maybe he didn't write the petition, but the cir a petition circulated with all the big face cards signing it to campaign for its destruction as soon as the fair was over. It wasn't going to survive. And then, there was a kind of embrace of it by the public, and you know, by 1900, it was an icon. And well, the senior painted a little, the well, Seurat painted a little picture of it the minute it was finished. Uh, every, all the progressive people thought it was very cool. There was another question. Catherine, yes, did you raise your hand? Yes, but I think this might answer it. Okay. Because does this say where he was standing from where you read the Eiffel because um, I was wondering if there's anywhere they documented like where he was yeah. mm -hmm. but then they're right. right. It was the back of the That's right. Each one so of them tells you where, where he's looking. That's huh. 
And I'm going to head to you so you can look at the stamps. There's a key, I think, or a little assemblage of the signatures. Other questions? Thanks, Stephanie.